What role did landscaping play in the development of the Chicago World's Fair of 1893? It would seem to be one of the most important aspects, considering two years ago this unsightly strip did not possess one redeeming feature except area and location. It was about as uninviting a strip of sand ridges and scrub oaks as fringes Lake Michigan at any point. Yet the final presentation of the Columbian Exposition cannot be understated. It was truly an event to behold. We have explored many aspects of this event thus far, so let's explore how landscaping played a part. So, thank you for joining me on this deep dive into beautification and landscaping of the Columbian Exposition of 1893. Let's dig in. Initially, what exactly is landscaping? It could be described as the beautification of natural outdoor setting and potentially categorized into three sections. The first being plants, the addition of specific species being native or foreign and potentially ornamental to enhance a specific area, to add depth, color, or even a, a tactile experience being through touch or edible plants. Of course, there is aroma, too, or the smell of the particular plants to enhance the atmosphere. The second being terrain, altering the shape of the land, which can be accomplished through grading, terracing, mounding, and backfilling, creating intricate works of art using one of the most classic of elements, earth. The third, structures either the addition or construction of various platforms, fences, walls, or covers, built out features to help traverse, beautify, and accentuate certain natural details or aspects. In regards to the event itself, we read from Campbell's Illustrated History that when it comes to the beautifying of the grounds themselves, no pains or money will be spared to make them all that the most artistic eye could desire. The most eminent landscape gardeners in the country are devoting their time and talents to this work, and we feel free to state that the grounds will be transformed into a garden of beauties. Also printed in this publication are a few updates of general development of this exposition. I would like to point out a few details in this section as it ties in with the previous episodes. This specific report is from Dion Geraldine, who is the superintendent of construction. The title reads, Progress of the Work, What 4,292 Men Are Accomplishing. Next, we read that, In the landscape department, 178 cubic yards of black soil and 9,314 cubic yards of sand have been moved during the week. So, again, to reiterate that these are just updates, we have read that the total moving of Earth equated to roughly 1.2 million cubic yards. What is interesting about this report is all of the specific details we receive. Let's uh, read through a few details here. 180 cars of material were received, and 178 delivered to the contractors at the various buildings. Ten hydrants have been placed in the horticultural building, making a total of 106 hydrants. Work on the electrical subway has been pushed forward to the extent of laying 1,730 linear feet. Three of the statues for the transportation building are finished and two of them have been cast. 20,000 feet of lumber have been placed in the horticultural building during the week, making a total of 1,271,331 feet. On the administration building, 160,000 feet of lumber and 20,000 pounds of iron have been added during the week. On the big manufacturer's building, the record shows 100,000 feet of lumber placed in position, making a total of 9,797,152 feet to date. 
in addition to which has been received 444,000 feet of lumber and 168,000 pounds of carpenter's iron. So, something to keep in mind is that in the few descriptions we read that this was during a weekly period, a single week has transpired and we have numbers for statues, lumber, iron, hydrants, piping, the electrical subway, and even an exact worker count as the subtitle indicates. Yet in the last episode, where was this type of exactness in the amount of glass or other notable materials. The glasswork seems to be a component that is consistently overlooked and rarely mentioned. Even when mentioned, it becomes obscured with a sentence like, many tons of glass were used. Is this an oddity then? That we have reports, weekly reports that is, that can specify all of these other details, yet other details are strictly vague. Is glass merely more specialized and cannot be quantified simply, like feet of lumber or pounds of steel? Specialized in the sense of customization, different sizes, shapes, and even rounded glass. These were only a portion of this report that specified the details. Yet other details such as glass are completely unknown. It is a very unusual detail or lack thereof, let's say. Moving on, let's read through another section describing the landscaping of this event, again from Campbell's Illustrated History, and it reads as follows. To fully appreciate the immense amount of work that has been accomplished on the World's Fair grounds, it is necessary for one to have visited the unimproved portion of Jackson Park one year ago. At that time, the visitor gazed upon one of the most uninviting swamps in the vicinity of Chicago and wondered if anything good could come out of it. It consisted of a stunted growth of oak trees on little knolls that here and there reached above high watermark, surrounded by tangled masses of willow shrubs, flags, and marsh grass. Within the short space of one year, during nearly one-third of which the cold weather prevented any outdoor work, the marsh has been transformed into a most beautiful park. The great landscape architects, Messrs. Olmsted and Co., have laid out the grounds with consummate skill upon a plan wherein it would be difficult to improve. More than two miles of lagoons wind their way gracefully through the grounds, passing by all the great buildings and forming several undulating islands, the longest of which contains about 17 acres. The margins of these islands have been thickly planted with trees, shrubs, flags, and lilies, thus accomplishing two objects, namely, affording a study of the flora indigenous to the vicinity of Chicago, and relieving the eyes of visitors with scenes from nature after they have been uh, satisfied with the handiwork of man. The interior of the largest island, with the exception of a narrow margin, was assigned. Together with five acres at the western end of the Midway Plaisance and seven acres adjoining the horticultural building to the Department of Horticulture. It became necessary to raise the entire area several feet in height, cover it with black soil, mingled with fertilizing materials, and arrange it in a similar manner, suitable for installing exhibits, without marring the landscape. As expected, difficulties were encountered at the beginning in attempting to conform to the wishes of exhibitors who desired to make their displays in a designated part of the grounds and in one locality. They were more or less controlled by the desire to have their own exhibit occupy a prominent position and look well, whether it injured their neighbor or marred the harmonious arrangement of the displays as a whole. In some instances, it was difficult to convince florists that general effects were sought after, which would compel a wide separation of different varieties of plants. But reflection convinced them that their own interests consisted in uniting with others to make a grand collection. Now, 
let's pull out some essential details and ask some questions. We have here an indication that the margins of the islands have been thickly planted with trees, shrubs, flags, and lilies. Now, the term flags didn't seem to fit and thought it was an odd term to include. So is this literally for inserting flags for countries or exhibits or events or strictly for landscaping purposes? Or could it have another meaning, maybe closer to staking territorial claims, where the term planting the flag means making a claim to something? Throughout history, this has been a consistent and documented aspect of claiming territory or land. It could be claimed in the name of country, of royalty, religion, or any other large conglomerate of power. What did the Americans plant on the moon, for example? This term was used to describe what was initially here before landscaping began, too, which is curious. It is an interesting data point and could simply be marking specific sections of buildings, pathways, trees, beds of flowers, transplanting locations, or any other landscaping endeavor. The skeptical side is wondering if these are subtle clues as to what was really happening at this event. Let's continue on. Another interesting detail is the area surrounding the horticultural building and how it became necessary to raise the entire area several feet in height. Certainly very curious. Is this due to the remaining section of the paragraph speaking to the exhibitors and their displays wanting them a specific way? So it was decided that in order to unite these displays in making a grand collection, the entire area was raised. I may be misinterpreting this section. Either way, the aspect of raising a section of the grounds several feet is again another task that seems out of the ordinary, if this was all surveyed and prepped initially. However, even in the last episode, we read that buildings were being shifted, reduced in size, and at one point, all buildings were moved north. So the plans were being modified. This appears to further reinforce that case. A project of this scale would have to be largely set in place to ensure every detail is completed, or as close to being completed for the opening of the event. Would this area not have been surveyed and these questions asked during that time? Why are these substantial changes being made as the construction is unfolding? This is also echoed in another publication called The Book of the Fair, discussing how in the preparation of these grounds, the entire surface was raised by several feet, covered with a rich black soil and with fertilizing substances, and so arranged as to conform as far as possible as the wishes of exhibitors, without impairing the general effect. A few other notes of interest from this book to consider. To reiterate once again about the initial state of the site, there was nothing to form an architectural background, nothing to lend variety of form and feature to the dull monotony of the landscape. On one side, the smoke of a great city dimmed the horizon. On another, it was lost in the desolation of loneliness. So, who was in charge of this endeavor, you may ask? Well, in order to convert this wilderness into a garden spot, was the task undertaken by Frederick L. Olmsted and his late partner H. S. Codman, since deceased, both among the foremost of landscape designers. To the practiced eye of these experienced artists, the very disadvantages of the site, its bareness, barrenness, and desert-like aspect suggested a plan that was at once unique and appropriate. Again, it cannot be understated how incredibly terrible this site seemed. To even label this section of land as a park in the first place seems like an insult with the initial descriptors that we are given. However, this endeavor was not a walk in the park. Of all the difficulties that confronted the landscape artists 
one of the greatest was to give the grounds such horticultural embellishment as would form a tasteful setting for the terraces, statuary, fountains, waterways, and other decorative features, giving to them all possible advantages of floral and arboreal vegetation. On or near the sites of former expositions was an abundance of trees and shrubbery available for such purposes, but here no such conditions prevailed, for winter lingers long on the prairie lands of Illinois, and in the early spring, vegetable growth near the marge of the lake is retarded by the chill night winds that sweep over its surface. Hence it was decided to mask the few groups of stunted trees that lay scattered throughout the tract with such a covering of shrubbery as would hide their dwarfish proportions and give to them the appearance of woodland foliage. Also to plant the edges of the waterways with hardy aquatic plants that would bear submergence and near them a background of willows and bright flowering plants with stretches of lawn as a further relief to the imposing structures of the Great White City presently being erected. One interesting note further on here is discussing the various grounds that could be complemented with lawns, terraces, painted with flowers and shrubbery, others in the form of embankments of stone or brick, surmounted with balustrades and with steps and landings in front of the entrances to the various buildings. The island itself was almost covered with foliage and with thousands of transplanted trees, representing most of the varieties of timber found in the United States. The mention of stone and brick embankments is an interesting comment. Now, the mention of the wooded island, however, which was intended to have transplanted trees, thousands of transplanted trees, is a very curious detail. So let's discuss this one briefly. What would be the process of transplanting trees in the 1890s? Well, one piece of technology that was used to dig in the initial stages of this event was the steam shovel. While this would have been effective for the time to dig and move earth, it is quite clunky and not exactly precise. It would be beneficial to maybe dig the holes around the grounds initially before transplanting. Whether it was used to dig out trees would be less probable, at least in my opinion. Another technique that may have been used would have been an air spade, essentially using a hollow rod that is attached to a hose, which then has compressed air forced through it, forcefully blowing away any dirt around the area. Unsure if this technology was actually available at the time, however it is quite simple in concept, and the use of compressed air was an essential service at this exposition, mainly being used for sewage disposal. This process would allow for the root structure of the tree to remain largely intact, yet this may make it more difficult to move, transport, and then replant. This option is pure speculation, but indeed possible. The most likely scenario would be manual digging. This is known as hand digging trees and is an art that is still used today. The concept is quite simple. Selecting the tree you wish to transplant, dig around the root section of the tree in a specific radius according to the size of the tree, once you have dug around the tree and separated the ball of the root system from the ground, it is then wrapped in burlap to contain it. It can then be manipulated quite easily while in the hole. It would probably be pruned too in order for easier transportation, which is potentially why we see many pruned trees and various imagery around the grounds. The difficult part, for this era anyways, would be to maneuver the trees out of its original spot and transporting it to a new location. Once it is placed, it would seem logical to have some sort of supports in place to ensure that it does not shift. This is only a best guess and maybe there are some landscape architects that may be able to speak more to this in general. One major concern with transplanting trees in this time period for this event is that the window for completing this task is limited 
by seasonal changes in temperature. Now, is there a specific time that trees need to reroute in order to survive these seasonal changes? With thousands of trees being transplanted, it would have been a continual process. Is there any documentation and imagery of trees being transplanted? Can we see any indication around the trees on the grounds that they have been moved into that specific position? How long would it take from start to finish to complete this endeavor of transplanting thousands of trees? It is somewhat interesting how there isn't a specific number of how many trees were transplanted for this event. Would this be standard practice? Or would these tree placements be known and drawn out on various plans to ensure that they would not interfere with other services underground, pathways, common areas, uh, footprints of buildings, and exhibits? As some of the imagery of the event has been scrolling through, we do notice that some of these trees are in close proximity to the buildings themselves. So are most of these transplanted also? Or did they happen to be conveniently placed and worked around during the construction process? Maybe clearing the large majority of brush and undesirable foliage to leave these select few trees to ensure a more natural landscape. An interesting thought here is the transporting of these trees to the wooded island itself. Did they use temporary bridges to get the equipment, workers, and the trees themselves to the island? Possibly barges? Or did they wait until one or two bridges were complete and then use those for main transportation? With all of the imagery and notes researched for these videos thus far, there did not appear to be any indication of rail lines being built to the wooded island, meaning from the mainland, over a bridge or a temporary structure, to ensure ease of transportation of these thousands of trees. Do remember too that this small section only references the wooded island as having thousands of transplanted trees. So how many more were required for the remaining acres on the grounds? numbering in the hundreds at this event. This endeavor has baffled me completely. It is hard to comprehend how this was completed so efficiently. There may be other perspectives or solutions that are missing in regards to transplanting thousands of trees and ensuring they all survive and appear healthy along with looking natural in their setting. They are also not small trees in many examples and would estimate that most range from 15 to 30 feet in height. So how was this transplanting all completed within the time frame we are given? Is it possible that there was transplanting of various trees and other greenery, just not on the scale as described previously? Or was there hardly any moving of plants and most of what we see through this imagery was already largely in place? I'll leave that one for you to decide. Let's get into some more imagery here. Taking a look at this image from the official views, we can begin to grasp the immense and dense sense of foliage. That was a bit of a mouthful. Anyways, this is a very popular image and it can give you a idea of how luscious these shorelines were. What we are looking at is roughly the area described in the early sections of the last article, describing the central wooded island. Despite the massive undertaking of clearing this marshland to a point of usability, does the imagery provided give a representation of a newly renovated area. Consider the plants and brush right next to the path on the right side of the image. They are practically growing over the railings which would have been installed within the last 12 months, if that. It is a similar pattern with the bridge, central in the image. We see that there are large bushes or maybe even trees surrounding the ends of the bridge where it meets the path on both sides. So, are we being led to believe that this area was prepped for construction, then built out, 
then landscaped accordingly, and upon the opening months of this event, every plant, bush, or tree seen in close proximity to a man-made structure grew to this point. We also did read that much of the margins of the islands, or outer perimeter, were intentionally planted. Is that what is represented here? It is difficult to come up with a counter-argument, stating that this indeed looks intentional, that these areas look manicured and prepared for this event in a meaningful way. Looking at another image here from the Library of Congress, it is a view of the more southern end of the Wooden Island, and has the same markers as the previous image, the outer edges almost looking overgrown. Even the surrounding patches of land, having foliage on them along with some that is growing straight out of the water. It is curious as to why these smaller pieces of land were kept and not cleared to ensure a larger canal for boaters to peruse. Maybe they were kept to keep a more natural aesthetic to this lagoon area, or were they potentially added in this process? Suppose it is hard to decipher which one would be the case here. Now, moving on to another image from the Library of Congress, we are looking towards the Wooded Island from the Administration Building. Looking on either side of the pathway, we can see large manicured areas of grass, or at least that's what they look like. Is it not curious that there does not appear to be one single plant of any kind in any grass section shown in this image. From the brief statement we read and the visual evidence of the images we just viewed, clearly the ability to plant any type of greenery was not only possible, but incredibly well done. Almost natural, one could say. So why would there be no plants put here? From a purely visual standpoint, it could use some. It just seems a bit empty. Now, we do see a tent of some sort, and maybe these areas were potentially designated for exhibits or displays. It could be possible that these spaces were not yet used, and not every detail was completed before the opening. There were large spaces of greenery such as this that had minimal plants or no plants around the central basin as well, which is interesting. I'll finish this thought by reading a section from Campbell's Illustrated History regarding these types of areas, and allow you to judge if it aligns with what is shown in imagery surrounding this event. The large number of potted plants placed on the balustrades surrounding the lagoons make a pleasing and attractive decoration, with gondolas, electric and steam launches, and myriads of waterfowls floating here and there on the flower-bordered lagoons, it makes a beautiful sight for the visitor. The plant decorations in all parts of the grounds are so profuse as to give the appearance of a vast garden. Every available spot that can be utilized for a tree or piece of shrubbery is used, so that the eye is continually delighted by the beauty and harmony of the landscape decorations to be seen in every part of the grounds, and shows a master's hand in the arrangement. Now looking at this image from Shep's photographs, we can see these large grassy areas on either side of the basin that may have one single plant placed at each end of each section, which does seem a bit lackluster in terms of beautification unless this was done for a specific purpose. We can see from this next image a closer look at these sections, and the single plant on the one side that was placed there. Something that is quite interesting about these sections is that they were a sunken feature. Taking a look at another set of images from the Library of Congress, with the first one being a closer look at this specific patch of grass, this little sign is quite amusing, warding off visitors from this grassy section. There is also something going on here with these two objects, but unsure what they might be. 
maybe plumbing for potential water features, or maybe irrigation to water the surrounding grass areas. That is unknown. So what we can see is that there is a slight grade difference from the central section to the path. Unsure if this was done to ensure more stability in the path or maybe just an aesthetic change in grade to add interest in this specific area. This is not particularly unusual though. Something of a similar nature was completed at the St. Louis World Fair in 1904. It was a much more impressive detail and was actually a main section named the Sunken Gardens within the grounds. What is also curious are these patches around the edge that seem to be missing any grass or sod. This can also be seen in the following image, where there are these sections that run around these grassy areas that appear to have not been applied yet. Are these potential gardens that were eventually abandoned due to time constraints? Are these sections for infrastructure, possibly? There does seem to be a variance in shape. Some are rectangular, some appear round. Or maybe something was there and it has since been removed. Whatever the case may be, they are a curiosity in these images. Yet there were a couple images that did seem interesting. So let's see what you think. We will start with an image that was used in the last episode discussing the hotel and music hall being roughly in the same footprint. The main detail being these grassy areas. We can see that the right side is not yet completed and this building on the right is the agricultural building. Notice the outbuildings placed around the structure, one specifically placed in one of these grassy areas. We can see that the agricultural building is under construction with large sections uncompleted. Yet, a few sections may be appearing completed behind the scaffolding. It is difficult to tell. This next image was from Charles Arnold and shows the grassy sections previously mentioned. They appear to be completely laid with sod, and there is even grass growing around the outer edges. The difference in grade is already accomplished as well. Are these sections on the first image an indication of these longer grass areas that are shown in the Arnold image? This image just seemed a bit strange in that this area had already been completed with sod. Not only that, but it may have been there for some time in order for the outer sections of grass to outgrow it. This aspect may be strange. Yet when looking at the info associated with this image, it states that it is viewing the agricultural building on July 16th, 1892. Now, looking back at our first image, the label reads the Court of Honor as it looked in June 1892. So what we have here is two depictions of roughly the same area that are only about one month apart potentially even less because the second image gives us a specific date of July 16th, 1892. Now, the main detail that has to be addressed is the agricultural building. Reference back and forth here. The building is basically finished, at least from this perspective, in the second image, which is quite a leap from the initial image. The buildings below are gone, any sign of major scaffolding has disappeared, unknown if the train tracks are there from this perspective along with any landscaping that was shown in earlier images. It certainly is a strange detail and find myself looking for these types of details more and more, testing the historical context to ensure that this event happened the way it has been represented. However, there are instances, and this is one of them, that seem mismatched. When there are two pieces of evidence representing the same thing, yet they indicate a differing perspective, let's say, that could be said to be unusual or even anomalous. Then we have room to question. We have run into quite a few of these instances already. So what are the questions here? 
how much of a force would it require to get from the first image to the second in terms of workforce, in terms of material, in terms of time frame. These are just general logistical questions that require some answering as the difference between these two images is both puzzling and impressive. What are your questions for these two images? The last point on this segment will be the shape of the dome. This may be a perspective issue or potentially a misrepresentation from the artist in the first image, but the dome seems to be a different size in each image. The first looks taller, more robust, and even larger in diameter, possibly. The completed dome in the second picture does not appear to fit the scaffolding shown initially. Again, maybe this is purely perspective, as one image is taken from above while the other is from the ground. Suppose that this is another one for you to ponder. A detail that seems to be missing, or at least very hard to discover, is the material that would have been used over much of the grounds, that material being sod or something similar. Through these episodes and additional research on this topic, it has yet to be specifically mentioned. The alteration or beautification of the grounds using grass pieces or sod. In terms of imagery, there may be a few that have indications of this on site. However, in terms of actual installation or laying of sod, there does not seem to be much, if any, visual evidence of this. The monumental scale of earth being moved would require an equal amount of beautification. This would include anything from laying sod, planting trees, terracing the grounds, planting gardens, marking out pathways, defining shorelines, and the general landscaping around all buildings. Many more specifics would be included in this, of course. We do have another passage here that indicates the arrival of various plants, and before reading this one, fair warning that the following plant names may be butchered, so my apologies in advance to any green thumbs out there. We read here. The village of Short Hills, New York, sent the finest collective exhibit of flowering and ornamental plants seen at the World's Fair. The United States nurseries occupied 20,000 square feet in the horticultural department, and also an acre of ground out of doors. The latter was planted with bulbs of every kind in the fall of 1892, and with hundreds of out-of-door hardy plants, which gave promise of a beautiful show. A train of 12 cars filled with the first consignment of plants arrived at Jackson Park early in the season. These included orchids, cy cyperdemus, ferns of all kind, anthuriums, begonias, both of the ordinary and tuberous rooted, a splendid display of azaleas, and rhododendrons, rhododendrons, sorry, asters, pelargoniums, pelargoniums, cannas, fuchsias, heliotropes, lantanas, petunias, gardenias, a large collection of roses, oricarias, bromeliads, aroids, several varieties of pitcher plants, and a great collection of palms and tree ferns. In regards to the shipping of various plants to this event, another interesting note also mentioned in Campbell's illustrated history is that the different foreign countries have begun to plant and arrange shrubbery and flowers from their own land around their buildings. When all is completed, the botanical student may study the flora of all climes by making a trip among the foreign gardens. Now, we have an indication that some of the landscaping was done by other countries around their own buildings, which in terms of branding and cohesiveness of your particular footprint and surroundings would make sense. Yet, this is again another logistical aspect to add to the landscaping story here. 
We even have mention here of the German presence and how they are handling this horticultural endeavor as the men in charge of the German floricultural exhibit have been busy during the past month planting seeds of flowers which they intend to have bloom early in the summer. At the opening, Germany will make a very fine exhibit of lilies of the Valley of Azaleas. During the summer months, that country will make a strong showing of asters, standard dwarf and potted roses, and later on will follow with hollyhocks, da dahlias, dahlias, and other flowers. With her usual promptness and energy, Germany is in the lead in this department as she is in many others in the extent of her exhibits and the progress made getting them ready. There is also mention of how the Florida building will have an assortment of palm trees and other indigenous plants associated with that area. We also see various imagery of the horticultural building and other stately buildings that include cacti, some of which are quite large. This is quite impressive and very interesting as all of these would have to be transplanted, which entails a host of other logistical aspects. In addition to these cacti and other tropical species, we have mention of other various transplanted trees located on the east end of the Midway Plaisance near the entrance of the exposition grounds is an orange and lemon grove. This is an exhibit from California and contains quite a large number of orange and lemon trees with both green and ripe fruit on them. On the opposite side of the Plaisance is a large exhibit of different kinds of fruit trees from all over the country. In this exhibit are dwarf cherry trees, only two years old, that have ripe fruit on their branches. Again, as we discuss all of these aspects of various landscaping and horticultural feats that were accomplished, is it unreasonable to have questions regarding the time frame of these endeavors? What is the probability of transplanting foreign plants and having them thrive in their new environment, or even just survive? Oh, hold on. My apologies. It does appear that plants brought to the grounds by different countries and from different climates are blooming. They all appear to thrive equally as well in Jackson Park soil as they did in their native soil. Well, what a relief. Do you not wonder what the fate of these plants would be after the fair itself? Possibly moved to other greenhouses or horticultural halls within the nation, or left them be and let nature take its course maybe even transplanted back to their native climate. Even though I am skeptical about the return journey of these plants, it was a curious detail. Noting how long it may take, preparing and shipping something of this nature to the fair or from the fair back home. There was this detail regarding the shipment of fresh fruit to the event, noting how arrangements have been made by Florida, California, New South Wales, and several other states to have a supply of fresh fruit constantly on hand at the exposition. The first supply from New South Wales arrived at Jackson Park May 10th. This fruit has been plucked the latter part of February and was eight weeks en route to San Francisco, besides four weeks longer from that city to Chicago. When it arrived, here it was not in as fresh condition as though just picked. As the season advances, ripe fruits of every description will be received daily from almost every section of the country. This fruit will form an exhibit and will also be distributed to visitors free. The Pacific states expect to distribute many carloads of their choicest fruit products before the closing of the exposition. Now, a couple notes with this section. The mention of New South Wales was not necessarily unusual, 
but the position within the initial sentence was. Maybe this is more of a subjective observation, yet it seems strange the way the first sentence was worded, almost indicating that New South Wales was a state similar to Florida, California, and several other states. New South Wales being the first British settlement in Australia. Moving on to the shipment of fresh fruit though, and it taking roughly 12 weeks, eight weeks from the shores of Australia to the port of San Francisco, and then an additional four weeks to Chicago. So the rough distance from San Francisco to Chicago is about 3,000 kilometers, or 1,850 miles, a rough measurement. Remember that this was merely a straight line from one location to the other, and this would most likely be more distance due to the position of rail lines over the landscape. The logistical aspect of this fair will be explored in an upcoming episode in the future, but this is an interesting note to keep in mind, as there were building supplies, exhibits, plants, and a mass of other miscellaneous stuff that was being transported to Chicago, not only within the United States, but from around the world. Do not forget the millions of tourists, workers in the tens of thousands, and exhibitors. Simply another data point to consider when viewing this imagery. Let's move on to another segment here. While searching through various imagery, I came across quite a few from multiple albums or collections that depicted the area we explored in the introductory episode. There was a section in which I described assets being used and viewed a selection of three images while including an additional one from Campbell's Illustrated History. What we are going to do is go through a selection of imagery and present the idea that, yet again, there may be inconsistencies within the timelines and even the visuals that are seen. Remember that these images are only clues, and the ideas about to be presented are to be observed, considered, and also questioned. Now, we begin this segment with the Wooded Island. A curious element of this exposition, as this section was almost entirely artificial in the sense of transplanting foliage, trees, flowers, and other natural plant life. We read earlier regarding the massive amount of trees, thousands in fact, that were transplanted here. However, this area was meant to hold various sites, and the attractions for the visitor on Wooded Island grow as each day passes by. Superintendent Thorpe is constantly adding something new and beautiful in the way of plants and flowers. Since the number of seats has been increased, the island is a great resort for tired people who go there and rest in the shade of the trees and eat their lunches. In addition to the many variations of plants, the wooded island will be one vast rose garden and will contain specimens of every kind of rose in existence that can be obtained and made to bloom. This rose exhibit will be the special pride of Chief Samuels and Superintendent Thorpe, and it is their intention to spare no time or trouble in making it complete. The main object to be attained is to so propagate and arrange the plants that during the continuance of the fair a wealth of blooming flowers will be one of the attractions. Every Tuesday during the exposition, cut flowers can be had in this department. The display of orchids number many varieties. These arrived at the park in poor condition and may not bloom very much during the season. Quite interesting details here. However, let's review some imagery. Initially, we have a scene that depicts the act of planting, and the image is even labeled as such. Planting on islands in lagoon. We see a very sparse section of islands that have minimal plant life on them, along with stakes or maybe flagged sections as described before. 
They are almost outlining the islands, which is interesting and can be seen more clearly in this image. Here we can see a view of the horticultural building in the process of being built, while in the foreground we have these small areas or islands that run along the main wooded island that have minimal growth on them. Along with this next scene, which is taken roughly from the same location, we can see that these last images were taken within the winter months, this image being from March 3rd, 1892. Roughly a month later, this image was taken overlooking the wooded island and wanted to include this one as it does appear to show some possible planting or transplanting evidence along the shore closest to us. There appears to be dark areas which could be holes that are dug in preparation for trees or other shrubs. Now, this is a tough detail to monitor because the transition from winter to summer can be incredibly different, where areas in the winter look sparse and desolate, yet once the warmer weather comes around and the summer months approach, the plants can alter the scenery almost completely. Anyone who lives in these areas that have both harsh winters and scorching summers can confirm this. I certainly can. Yet it is a detail to keep in mind when viewing this type of imagery and considering the possibility of what these areas looked like from year to year throughout the development stages to the final event and the accompanying images we get. Despite a basic understanding and experience of seeing plant life seclude for the winter and then take over in the summer, some of these images do raise questions. A quick example of this idea would be using some imagery surrounding the horticultural building. Initially we have this image which is sourced from a book called Portfolio of Views. So we are looking northward with the horticultural building on the left, the Illinois building closer to the center behind that, and then the art palace in the background. If we are looking at a map, roughly in this direction shown here. In comparison with these few images showing these areas quite full of plants running along the fence line, this growth isn't overly impressive, however it's more of an example of what to consider while thinking in terms of landscaping. The next selection of images show a similar scene and this view is roughly in the middle of the electrical and mining looking roughly northward and towards the wooded island. Checking the map, we are roughly here, taking note of the edges of the main wooded island and the small patches of land in the lagoon. These images taken in October of 1891. The next couple of images are taken from the same vantage point and are looking westward towards the horticultural building. Take note again of the main wooded island and the smaller sections of land surrounding it in the lagoon. These areas are quite well manicured so far and do not appear to have any plant life on the shorelines. We do have a couple of lads out here potentially digging or staking or some sort of landscaping activity. Suppose it is a bit curious that if there were already two people out here working, there would be more, even any activity at all in other areas of the image. On the left is the transportation building, and roughly in between these two buildings is supposed to be the Coral Hall. Now, looking at the map briefly to indicate where this Coral Hall is situated in relation to this building, looking at one of the previous images, we can see that this is most likely this Colombian Commissary building. Is this another case that is similar to the Music Hall and Temporary Hotel? Both buildings having a footprint incredibly close, if not interfering with each other. Looking at more of the earlier imagery, we can see that it no longer exists and could very well fit nicely in between the horticultural and coral hall. Even so, this is a bit peculiar and is again another building either quite close 
or partially on top of the footprint of a main fair structure. That was merely a tangent, and we'll get back on track here as this next section involves similar imagery and ties in with the initial introduction video. Let's get a bit more context here. The last section of images were taken from a raised vantage point, that point being shown here in this image, being from September 1891. This is labeled as the fire engine house, which is an interesting detail. This was also the same building in which I stated was potentially drawn in. It was a claim that was proven incorrect, and this building can be seen in multiple images. This is beside the point, however. Looking at the map, we are looking eastward and are positioned approximately here. An interesting detail is that we can see the temporary hotel in the background of this image. Going back to our last two images, the first is a wider angle of the small island in front of the wooded island. The second image shows us a closer view and figured that maybe these images could be used to cross-reference some of the later imagery of this event. What follows here is unusual, but I'll let you be the judge of that. This tree here, it seems to resemble one of the trees that was central in the introductory exploration of assets. Does the tree in Charles Arnold's image look like this tree, which is in Shep's photographs? on the right side of the path. It is a bit hard to distinguish, yet it does seem to have similar characteristics of the twisted branches, mainly the way we can see the initial branch split off and then the split of the upper section in both images. Understandably, this may be pushing it, yet bear with me. If we reference the image that has a wider angle and bring forward the image that shows the trees in relation to the bridge, there should be these other three trees on the left. An argument may be that they were still scheduled to be transplanted, which is always possible. Apparently there were thousands of trees that were transplanted on the wooded island, and surely these smaller islands around it within the lagoon were no exception. However, while investigating this further, it became evident that I was wrong, at least partially. Looking at this image from Sheps, and now introducing another image from Jackson's famous photographs, we can see that this tree in the path was cut down. An interesting twist in this investigation. We can see the stump from the tree that was positioned on the right of the path, which is another detail of note. We do not see any remains of this middle tree on the left though, which is a bit odd. These two images are taken roughly from the same position, and it may be possible that this man is blocking any potential remnants of the middle tree. It is difficult to say. After some more digging, there was this image from Charles Arnold's collection, which was an almost perfect viewpoint. This is the same section of land with the wooded island in the background. We can again see the stump from the tree in the path. It's very interesting. There is also the tree with a left lean that was shown in most of the previous images, now having a right lean as the image is taken from the opposite direction. The tree on the other side of the path is also gone. What this image does incredibly well is showcase how full and luscious the greenery was on these two islands. Just look at all the bushes, the trees, saplings, grasses, etc. And this is clearly during the fall season, maybe even after the fair. When investigating this image online in the archive, there was a curious detail, or lack thereof, let's say, as there was no date indicated as to when this image was taken. It is labeled ND, which is unusual and could lead to some additional questions. If we begin referencing back and forth between the initial images of the islands and seeing how sparse they are compared to these later images, 
along with others that show the wooded island in full bloom during the summer months of the year, we can see a transformation that is truly incredible. Those initial images were taken in October of 1891, remember, so there probably wasn't much more planting or landscaping happening until the following year. So was the large majority of what we see on this wooded island transplanted within the year of 1892? We do have one image that depicts what appears to be land workings with potentially transplanted trees that do have structural support. Yet this is only one image and only one tree having any support. Suppose that would be a question for a landscape architect. If thousands of trees were transplanted on this island, would we see most, if not all of them, having some sort of support system to ensure that they would take, providing them with some stability through any harsh elements like wind or the wintry seasons? So, going back to our images of the islands, both pre-event and potentially afterwards, we see the immense transformation that does indeed merit questions. Does the majority of the plant life that is missing from the initial images appear transplanted in the later images? Is that even possible to tell? Where did all of these trees and foliage come from? How did they transport, plant, and ensure the absolute incredible display that has been depicted in much of the imagery surrounding this event? How was this completed within the time frame? While going through this section, there was this image that seemed to stand out and tie in with this discussion. Again, from Charles Arnold's collection showing the fisheries building, then the government building behind that, and then the manufacturer's building in the distance. The buildings are not the main details, though. The difference of landscaping from the right side of the image versus the left certainly is. This is only a small section, yes. However, why is the section on the left side of the path appearing completely, well, complete? It seems this area has been laid with sod. Trees are in place. The bridge is complete and looks totally different from the landscape on the right side of the path. Maybe this is too critical. Yet, if we look at the map and see where this image is potentially being captured from, behind Charles would be the art palace and the stately buildings. Maybe this small section was merely completed or didn't require any additional working. That is unknown. These are just very unusual details and hope you can decipher some meaning from these findings. We are going to start winding down this presentation and would like to add some additional data points as in previous episodes. The end sections of these presentations containing interesting finds and potential leads, or maybe even discoveries or rediscoveries, let's say. It is very much my favorite part of these presentations and leave them until the end primarily so they don't interfere with the main objective of the episode's theme and also for those that are truly interested and invested in these topics, as I am. Before moving on, there is a clarification that needs to be addressed. In the initial introductory episode, I mentioned that the tree pointed out in the previous segment was potentially an asset. It seems quite clear that the tree discussed was actually there, as we have evidence of it both being present in many images and then removed in others. Referencing the image from Campbell's illustrated history, we can see this same tree and this image was taken from the wooded island. Uh, proper, let's say. I'm significantly less certain that this tree is an asset. I did compare this image with one of the previous to make the case of perspective of where the tree is in both images compared to the mining building. In fairness, I did admit that this could simply be a perspective issue. This may be the more likely case. The truth is, I don't know. Now, in saying that, 
let's remember, a great many people in the world school themselves to seeing through the eyes of others by reading their written descriptions, but they do not in that way secure the real pleasure of sightseeing. It is no doubt true that the eyes of different people are slightly different in focus, and this perhaps accounts for the various descriptions we have of the attractions at the Columbian Exposition. The stereoscopic effect with which a person can see any objective reality with their own eyes is entirely lost when seen simply through the description of another. But to aid the reader to fully appreciate the descriptive matter, we accompany these descriptions in most instances with copper plate engravings, which are exact reproductions of the originals, which viewed in connection with the text presents perfect pictures to the mind, the preservation of all that was interesting and beautiful, both in buildings and exhibits will act as an educator for the public in learning to appreciate high art and also tends to improve the mind. That quote coming from Campbell's Illustrated History, the same publication that was investigated in the initial episodes of this series. So let me then ask you, were even the handful of images that were discussed concerning at all? Did you think that the images shown represented a true account of historical data? Were they manipulated? Are these exact reproductions of the original images? I'll always try to recognize any mistakes and correct them. However, this little section was meant to reinforce the rationale for skepticism in general. There is certainly more than enough evidence to at least question these events to the absolute maximum extent. This segment of assets being used was a substantial one in the introduction and wanted to clarify it further. The bottom line being that this information around the Chicago World's Fair of 1893, whether it be from documents or through imagery, is all clues. There are anomalies here and potential shenanigans at play. Allow me to illustrate that point with this brief dive into the initial dedicatory exercises. These took place on October 21st, 1892, in an unfinished manufacturer's building. So, while searching through imagery to cross-reference with documents, there was this section in the history of the World's Fair that was beyond fascinating. Doing this to see the progress of the manufacturer's building from the summer months to October. Again, it is a speedy transformation. Yet the first section in this chapter was quite interesting. Let's see what you think. On the afternoon of the 21st of October, 1892, where only a few years before, a solitary Indian was monarch of all he surveyed. There transpired an event which will forever perpetuate the name and fame of Columbus. This event will always be known as the dedicatory exercises of the world's Columbian Exposition and took place in the unfinished manufacturer's building in the presence of 100,000 people. There were exercises or there had been for a week or more before in various portions of the globe, all in honor of the man who discovered America, conspicuously in Italy and Spain, and at various points throughout our own country. So what do you make of the Jackson Park area being under the dominion of an Indian monarch? only a few years prior to this exposition date. This was such a weird detail that is quite brief in the document, yet hits on something that may be truly paradigm shifting in this entire story. The same type of disclaimer with the brick shoreline will apply here when that was first introduced. This may be just an unusual detail that will fade into obscurity, 
but felt it was definitely worth a mention and maybe it will be a critical point in future episodes. Now, speaking of bricked shorelines, excellent segue, let's bring up an image from a publication called 100 Photographic Views of Chicago. Certainly an interesting visual here. We have a long stretch of shoreline that is bricked, which may not seem too unusual if you have been watching these presentations. However, the description of this image is where it becomes straight up anomalous. Fishing on beach, Lincoln Park. All right, let's get our bearings here. The Columbian Exposition was situated in Jackson Park, and we briefly explored roughly 5,000 feet of bricked shoreline, which was presented in the previous episode. At the end of that episode, there were a couple of images showing unknown projects being completed at Lincoln Park, being north of Jackson Park. 8.5 miles or over 13 and a half kilometers north of the Chicago World's Fair grounds. A rough measurement indeed as it goes from the northernmost tip of Jackson Park to the southern edge of the Lincoln Park along the shoreline. Now, this is not an indication that this bricked shoreline was lining the entire distance. However, having another data point of a substantial amount of shoreline being finished in this manner is very interesting. Unsure as to where exactly this location is and whether it continues behind the perspective of the photographer, could we safely say there is at least one to two kilometers of bricked shoreline here? A conservative guess. It could be possible that there are more sections of the shoreline that are finished in this manner. The Chicago shoreline is largely comprised of either large stone barriers or concrete sections that run kilometers in modern day. This is now becoming a serious question for the waterfront along Chicago. As this series continues, we may stumble into more depictions of these anomalous shorelines. The basic questions to ponder from here are how much of the shoreline was indeed brick? Who built kilometers of bricked shoreline? When was this built? And why was this done in the manner it is presented? I do look forward to your comments and thoughts below. Since we are in the Lincoln Park area, let's review another image that is actually in the same publication. In the end of the last episode, there were a couple of images presented that were labeled as unidentified projects. They were labeled as construction and are questionable at best. If you enjoyed those previous images, this one should definitely pique your curiosity. So let's see what you think. All right, so as you browse this image, we will go through the description of this particular scene, titled View of the Drainage Canal. The Chicago Drainage Canal is one of the most stupendous undertakings ever carried out by the city of Chicago. It provides for the disposition of Chicago sewerage through an artificial canal from Lake Michigan through Chicago to the nearest point, the Des Plaines River. When completed, it will form an important link in the canal system about the Great Lakes, facilitating the connection between the central states and the Gulf of Mexico, and also be of considerable aid in improving the city's water supply. The cost of the complete canal is estimated at $26 million. A very interesting passage, as this looks eerily similar to the two images from the previous episode, even showing the large cranes that were bleeding off in those images as well. So the description mentions that this drainage canal is used for the disposition of sewage. This was initially confusing as the term disposition 
relates to one's state of mind, which is a more modern definition. However, it stems from Latin as disposit or dispositus, which further relates to dispos or dispose. And there's a little etymology kernel for you. So this is a canal for sewage, which goes from Lake Michigan through Chicago and then connects to the nearest point on the Des Plaines River. And the Des Plaines River is said to run through Chicago and go southbound, connecting to the Mississippi, and eventually, as the description stated, to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, what is unusual is that we have notes on the previous images that said it was potentially from the South Lagoon in Lincoln Park. There was indeed a question mark after that note, though. This image appears to be from the same canal as the previous. We have the same style of brickwork on top, a discolored middle section and then potentially large stone sections below. This is speculation based on the previous imagery. However, it can be seen from this new image that this was an impressive endeavor. Only a cool 26 million to complete this project too. Considering the total cost of the Columbian Exposition was close to 32 million, this seems like an expensive project. Unless this is not the South Lagoon at all. Is it possible that these pictures depict sections of the massive canal that runs north of Chicago? A canal that does have some unusual sections within the city, running from the Des Plaines River, yet as you move northward it becomes incredibly direct and straight, making only gradual turns and then, as the description states, connects to Lake Michigan. It is definitely an aspect that requires more research, and there is one additional note for this before moving on. While browsing this canal on Google Earth, specifically where it connects to Lake Michigan, there is a unique building situated nearby. Directly at the opening of this canal, towards the lake, sits the Baha or Baha'i House of Worship, a truly beautiful building and it easily stood out with its manicured grounds. It is a building that will require more research and simply felt that it was indeed worthy of a mention. The link to the official website will be posted below for further investigation. So what is truly happening here with these images that potentially show construction or excavation of a massive canal? The scale of these endeavors should not be understated. It would seem that such a project would have plentiful documentation, and maybe it does, as this new image was in a publication online. It just requires some digging. And now, this was a brief aside. There was some new information that came to light as I was editing and researching here, and we'll need some confirmation from locals if possible. The canal initially suggested was probably not correct, as the Des Plaines River runs north to south, roughly 10 miles west, or inland from the Chicago city center, which does add some more mystery to these images. Overall, completely unsure where these would be, and clearly the historical documentation is just as confusing or confused itself. Okay, moving on to the final segment before wrapping up. Please remember that these are only findings and to use a healthy level of discernment when listening to this section specifically. This is basically speculation based on imagery and previous elements of this event. The idea being proposed here is that there may be sections of the grounds, specifically pathways, that could have largely been finished in brick or some sort of mosaic tile. We will go through a few images here, present some details, and see what you think about it. 
The first image is labeled as Cafe along with Indiana and Illinois building. There are two different versions here because the initial image was quite blown out in terms of exposure. The second is an attempt to reduce that high exposure and bring out some other details. Draw your attention to the image on the left side, looking around the bottom right near this stand here. We can see some lines or markings in the ground. It is difficult to make out, yet they create many parallel lines that do appear as some sort of tile, brick, or mosaic. What is interesting about this specific example is that these details are missing from the image on the right. Unsure if this section was brushed over a bit to create contrast for the title on the right side, but it is certainly curious. Take note of these patterns that run along the path also. These lines that appear in much of the imagery around this event. It is hard to discern what these may be, and it could be the gathering of gravel or dirt from thousands of people tracking through a specific area. It is something to keep in mind though. Additionally, to try and be objective, we do have examples that almost appear like uh, smudges of fingerprints, which would certainly appear like some sort of bricked element if placed in the right spot. Is that what happened with this previous image? Always a possibility. Let's take a look at another image here. We are looking at the mines and mining building and want to direct your attention to this small section here. There may be something here with these lines that are angular, at least from this perspective, highlighting a potential section here with lines on either side that are lighter in color. This is interesting because there are clear markings from some sort of wagon or coach or just transport in general. There are parallel lines running through this top layer of material, which is most likely dirt. Those lines are dark, even going from the shadow on the left side into the sun on the right. This questionable section almost appears as if it was washed out by water, which may be what is happening with this highlighted area in the bottom of the image. Is it possible that the dirt and gravel that was indicated in the initial plans was brought in and dispersed over major sections of finished pathways? or common areas such as this? And are we seeing an indication of it here? Unsure with this image in particular, but these questions come to mind when we have imagery such as this. This scene from the dedicatory and opening ceremonies of the World's Columbian Exposition, labeled as General Views, Fisheries Building in Background. It does seem to be a photographic image, yet looking around we can see illustrated elements. Quite a few of them. Almost all the people are illustrated. The pile of material, maybe wood on the left, is illustrated here. And the main detail here being that the pathway is brushed over and the markings are evident everywhere. There are brush marks near the bottom of the image that are incredibly sloppy, not even bleeding off the edge of the image. We can see the original path underneath. There is a major contrast between our brushed pathway and the path leading to what looks like the woman's building here on the right. The brushwork also blatantly goes over people sitting down, is covering a portion of this sign, and goes over this bricked culvert, or whatever this may be. Many of the shadows are just awful, too. Not even accurate to the size of the people, or even accurate to where the people are standing in some circumstances. Do you think our retoucher got any flack for editing this image, only to find out that the shadows that were created didn't match the original shadows in the actual photographic image? shown on this light pole, for example. That's a bit unfortunate. This is incredibly sloppy, 
And the reason for showing this image is to reinforce the idea that maybe large sections of pathways shown in the imagery surrounding this event have been manipulated. Moving on to this next image of this section, it is a new perspective of the peristyle to show off this bricked flooring or path in between these monumental Corinthian pillars. Now, what if this finishing spread into the main basin area of the grounds? What do you think of this image from the same publication depicting the main peristyle area? What are these elements on the ground here? And why do they have rigid, straight lines? This could be attributed to any number of artifacts. That is always a possibility. Yet, what if there were evidence in other images, such as Charles Arnold's collection? Look at this image and check out the pattern on the bridge. It certainly is unique. It could also be a mixture of track dirt and gravel with certain elements reflecting light better than others. Yet, what about the bottom right corner? And really stretch your perception here. Do you see the parallel lines that run towards the peristyle? In some cases, they appear like brickwork, or even could be a octagonal mosaic style or pattern. Again, these are very fine details and could be something different entirely. Yet at this point in the investigation, it does not seem outlandish to propose this type of detail. This theory has certainly altered the perception of viewing many of these original images. Even this one used before in presentations of the basin area from the official views of the world's Columbian exposition. We see these areas on the pathway that seem worn, and do they have any recognizable patterns, line work, symmetry, or any other telling signs that may be more than what it seems? Even this small section in the bottom left-hand corner where there are indications of white lines. What about this final image here of this same area around the basin, where we are looking at the agricultural building? Notice these lines again, running parallel on the left side of the image. What is also unusual is that there is a material that seems to be on top, whether that is dirt or gravel or something else that is unknown. And what exactly are these gentlemen doing here in this image? What are these piles of nearby? There is some process of either removing or placing something in this section of the image, as we can see the contrast of the edge here. A very curious image, indeed. And as we close this presentation, many more images of the grounds will scroll through, and consider all the questions proposed within this episode. Taking a look at the foliage, the plants, the layout of grassy areas or sodded areas, horticulture of all the various flowers, gardens, and exhibits based on this specifically. Consider the amount of work this would entail for all these endeavors. Think about the time frame in which we are given and how much earth was initially moved and worked. Then compare that with the growth that we see in these images. Now, back to our bricked pathway situation momentarily. This is a substantial claim. To propose that large sections of the pathways were of more durable brick and tile materials. Yet, it is something to keep in mind and would appreciate your perspective on various imagery moving forward. As these videos progress and explore various aspects of this exposition, it is putting together a series of filters that you may apply when viewing a simple image of a stately building or scene and notice the image may be edited. Maybe there are strange contrasting accounts or the foundation could be made of a more durable material. Seeing light posts puts forth the question of the underground electrical. Noticing a fire hydrant makes you question the vast subterranean piping and machinery used to ensure its function. 
viewing a sewer drain and thinking of the immense plumbing required for the millions of exhibitors and visitors. And now with this episode, we have put together a filter for the vast amounts of vegetation, the manicured landscapes, and the common areas along with the vast amount of trees and other foliage that was transplanted. These are the big mysteries that surround this event, and the further we delve into this bottomless history, the more questions seem to arise, which certainly makes for an interesting series at the very least. As always, I leave you with something to ponder. This section comes from a publication called Photographic History of the World's Fair and Sketch of the City of Chicago. It is from 1893 and is a description of Jackson Park, and is simply an interesting account of the area with another aspect of the Chicago shoreline to consider. It reads as follows. Jackson Park, area 586 acres, about 8 miles from the courthouse, bounded by Lake Michigan on the east, Stony Island Avenue on the west. 56th Street on the north, and 67th Street on the south. This beautiful park has been brought into great prominence of late by reason of its selection as the site for a portion of the Columbian Exposition. About one-third of the park has been improved up to the present year, although immense works have been in progress for some time in preparing the unimproved portion for the public. These works include excavating and dredging for the chain of lakes which are to have connection with Lake Michigan, bridge and breakwater construction, leveling and embanking, and landscape gardening on an extensive scale. The improved portion of the park at the northern end. Here there is a broad stretch of sward which has been used frequently as a parade ground by the militia and by large picnic parties. This is surrounded or hemmed in by a wooded avenue of great beauty, which opens upon a seawall and a beautiful view of Lake Michigan. There is erected here an immense shelter of great architectural beauty, where thousands may on occasion be protected either from the heat of the sun or from a sudden rainfall. The trees and shrubbery in the improved part of the park, as well as the flowers, are very attractive. Although the variety which one finds in some of the other parks is lacking, the number of trees and shrubs in the unimproved portion is comparatively small. About 61st Street there is one clump of oaks and maple, shot here and there with bunches of fiery sumac. There is another large grove west and north of this. Beyond there, except for a few small bunches and a fringe along the west fence, the unimproved portion is unbroken by wood. And with that is the end of this presentation. I would like to thank you for your time and hope that this provided a new perspective into the Columbian Exposition of 1893. If you enjoyed this one, give it a like. I look forward to reading your comments below. So, if you are interested in learning more about the manipulation of historical documents, consider subscribing and learning about it with me.